you know, just to be totally honest, normally children don't start crying until after I start talking. So this might be a bad sign. I hadn't even started yet. If you would go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 15, we'll be at the the last part, the closing paragraphs of chapter 15. And I talked a little bit, just briefly about this on Wednesday night, because of something I heard on Tuesday night. And Wednesday night we were in the book of Jonah, so this is totally different. But the principle, I think, is much the same. Do we... And I'm talking about we as Christians. Do we really care about people? Alright, and while you're thinking about that question, does Jesus really care about people? And then the question that ties those two questions together, does Jesus care whether or not we care about people? I wanted to save this particular comparison to the end of the message because this message is, uh, I know preachers say this all the time, but this is actually more brief just because of what the information is in this text today. There's, it's more of a, a narrative than it is a, a letter that's telling you to do something. But the question really is, Do we care about people, and does Jesus care whether or not we care about people? And here's the the little illustration that I'll come back to when we're ready to, to conclude. I've got kids. Many of you have children. When you tell your children to do something, are you just looking for their obedience? Or are you also looking at their attitude while they're being obedient because you know you can tell them well you can go kicking and screaming or you can go smiling and singing but you're going to do what I tell you to do right that, that's, how, that's how that works right I didn't understand it it's funny how this works right you don't understand it when you're a kid and your parents tell you one day you're going to understand what I'm talking about and you say no you're crazy and then you got kids of your own and then man exactly like they said and so do you want them just to do are you just looking for behavior modification or are you trying to get to their heart because you can get behavior modification right with a wooden spoon or a belt or the back of your hand you can get behavior modification but that may not get to the heart of a young person they may just be well I don't want to get that whipping I don't want to go cut me a switch so I better just do what they tell me to do but that's obedience but it's not really a heart change so God is looking for more out of us than just yes sir I'm going to do what you say but I'm not going to like it right does Jesus care whether or not we really care about people. And I'm just, not to be a spoiler, but Jesus cares about people. He cares a lot about people. He has compassion about people and their circumstances. And that's not by accident, because if He has it, we ought to have it. Let's see what the Bible says. Matthew chapter 15, beginning in verse 29. Two incidents in the ministry of Jesus. Here's what Matthew writes as the Holy Spirit inspires. Departing from there, Jesus went along by the Sea of Galilee, and having gone up on the mountain, he was sitting there, and large crowds came to him, bringing with them those who were lame, crippled, blind, mute, and many others, and they laid them down at his feet, and he healed them. So the crowd marveled as they saw the mute speaking, the crippled restored, and the lame walking, and the blind seeing. 
And they glorified the God of Israel. And Jesus called His disciples to Him and said, I feel compassion for the people, for the crowd, because they have remained or are remaining with Me now three days and have nothing to eat, and I do not want to send them away hungry, for they might faint on the way. The disciples said to Him, Where would we get so many loaves in this desolate place to satisfy such a large crowd? And Jesus said to them, How many loaves do you have? And they said, Seven and a few small fish. And he directed the people to sit down or recline on the ground. And he took the seven loaves and the fish and giving thanks, he broke them and started giving them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the people. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they picked up what was left over of the broken pieces, seven large baskets full. And those who ate were 4,000 men, besides women and children. And sending away the crowds, Jesus got into the boat and came to the region of Magadan. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray you will speak clearly to our hearts through this text of your word. And God, I pray that you will guide my heart, guide my voice, Guide my words. Don't let me say something that's not according to your word. Lord, would the meditations of my heart and the words of my mouth be pleasing in your sight. For you are my rock and my redeemer. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We've heard these stories before, haven't we? Not the exact same stories, but stories like these. Jesus heals a lot of people, right? How, how many times have we read that? we are finished 15 chapters of Matthew. We've read a lot of stories about Jesus healing people. We've read another specific story about Jesus feeding a large crowd. Not the same story. There there are two different incidents, uh, 5,000 and 4,000. So I don't want you to think it's just a repeat because it's not. In fact, there's some distinct differences. We're going to see that it's going to be amazing. But he's done this before. This is what he does. Jesus heals. Jesus provides. Right? Right? So what's so special about these two circumstances that would cause us to be reading about them again, uh, uh, like an extra account to say, just in case you didn't notice when he did this before, let's, let's look at another time he did this. Because that seems like what, that's what we're reading, right? We, we've been through Matthew. We've, we've seen countless miracles. But there's just just two things, and they're very obvious, two things in in this text. Number one, Jesus cares about people. Jesus cares about people. So before I say anything else, what does that tell us by means of personal application? Jesus cares about people, so what should we do? We should care about people. It's as simple as that. It's no trick question. I'm not building up to a bigger principle that's what the principle is jesus cares about people therefore we should care about people in fact as you read the first three verses here because that's one paragraph verse 29 to, to verse 31 and it talks about how jesus went along by the sea of galilee he goes up on a mountain he's sitting down and all these crowds are coming to him but they're not coming empty-handed. They're bringing everybody they can find, everybody they know that has some sort of sickness or problem, and they're going to Jesus. So here's another point of personal application. Where are we supposed to go with our issues? Run to Jesus. It's, it's that simple. You got a problem? You run to Jesus. Where did we go And I'm talking about me and my wife and my family. Where did we go 
when my daughter spent all this time in the hospital. And, and more to the point, where were we begging everybody else to go with us? We got to go to Jesus. So, do you imagine or can you how much less moving it would have been if instead of seeing all over social media from multiple pastors, multiple churches, people, I mean probably over, over a thousand different people who responded to us over these last six weeks praying, how much less moving would it have been if we'd have got all these comments, you know, hundreds and hundreds of comments on social media that said, hey, good luck. Wish you the best. Sending you our positive energy. That doesn't mean anything to me. You know what means something to me? We are praying to God. There's nothing more important than that. I'm going to talk to God about your issue. I'm praying that He's going to do something. That, that means more than you can imagine. Because Jesus cares about people. So, if that's... I mean, just look at the huge categories of people. Lame, crippled, blind, mute, many others. Who knows what the many others are? All kind of different issues, all kind of different problems, all kinds of needs. And they all went to the same place. They all went to Jesus. Because Jesus cares. Leon Marr said that Matthew here in verse 31, makes it clear that Jesus' healings were not confined to any narrow range of disabilities. Whatever the physical problem, He solved it. And isn't that why we pray? Why would we pray if we didn't somewhere in our heart and soul believe that God could do something about it? Right? Is there any need to pray to someone in, in whom we have no faith at all? I mean, if we don't have any hope, any confidence, any faith or trust, or even an expectation, why would we pray? Has that ever, has that ever gone through your mind? Have you ever thought that through? That's why we pray. Praying is not just a mindless exercise. It's certainly not supposed to be. It's, and by the way, when we're praying, we're not talking to each other. When you pray, maybe this, this might set somebody free today. From Maybe you've got a, a, a fear of praying in front of other people or praying out loud in a group setting. Well, let me just remind you something. You're not talking to us. You're talking to God in heaven. Because if you're talking to me, your prayer's not going to do you any good. We pray to the Lord God Almighty because He alone has the power to save and to heal and to do miracles. That's who we pray to. And so, all these people were healed. They were set free. They were restored. Whatever it was. And the result was that Look at the end of verse 31. The, the, they glorified the God of Israel. Now I'm going to tell you something here that's going to be really interesting for this next last paragraph. Jesus is now blessing Gentiles with the same blessing that He had blessed Jews. You know what the biggest difference is between why we know these are two separate incidents? Because what's coming up in verse 32, the feeding of the 4,000, you know how we know that's not just a duplicate with a different number of the feeding of the 5,000? Because the 5,000 men plus women and children was largely Jewish. The 4,000 men plus women and children is Gentile. They're in Decapolis. You know what that is? That's ten Greek cities. That's not Jewish folks. That's Gentile. 
And now Jesus is extending the same grace and mercy and care and compassion to the Gentiles as He had to the Jews before. You know what that tells us? It's foreshadowing. He hadn't said it yet, because what did He always say? My ministry is first primarily to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, right? That's where He's going. And it's not until the book of Acts that we see later after Pentecost, the gospel goes to the Gentiles. But guess what Jesus just did? Hey, y'all, I got a secret. It's not just for the Jews. It's for everybody. It's for everybody. His gospel can already be seen as intended for everyone. Matter of fact, one commentator argued that the, the significance of the baskets of leftovers even means something about that. So before we get there, let me go on to number two. Number one, Jesus cares about people. Number two, Jesus has compassion for people. And he says as much right there in verse 32. He calls his disciples and says, I feel compassion for the people. Now back in Matthew 9, at the end of chapter 9, we read something similar, but it said Jesus saw the people and he had compassion for them. It was third person. Matthew is relating this event. That's when he said, you know, they look like sheep without a shepherd and we should pray to the Lord of the harvest. All right, so he had compassion on them. But now this is him saying it. I have compassion for the people, for the Gentiles. And so Jesus cares. Jesus has compassion. And why does he have compassion? Well, he describes it pretty clearly, setting up this miracle. It says, they have remained, or are, literally it's are remaining with me now three days, have nothing to eat, and I don't want to send them away hungry. They might faint on the way. So Jesus cares. These people have remained with me. They've listened to my teaching. They've followed me. They've watched my miracles. And they're sticking with me. I care about them. I don't want them to have any kind of adverse effect from going off. You know, maybe they hadn't eaten or maybe all whatever they brought with them is gone and they don't have anything else. And then they, it's been three days. They probably didn't plan on staying three days, right? And so, I don't want to send them away hungry. They might faint on the way. Now, what's so interesting, we're reading about these two stories, right? And look at verse 33. The disciples said to him, Where would we get so many loaves in this desolate place to satisfy such a large crowd. Now, I just read that. And I'm going to give you about five seconds to think about it. Anybody notice anything odd about that? They should, shouldn't they? What has already happened at this point? The feeding of the 5,000, right? They've seen all this before. I mean, almost exactly with a, a crowd larger than this, right? So why on earth do we have verse 33 in our Bibles? Why is that? Why did they ask? Why, out of 12 of them, not one of those 12 men looked at one of the other and said, I, I bet he's going to do the same thing he did last time. We're about to see a miracle, right? Nobody said that. How could you be so dense and just just completely disengaged you're walking with a man who has done this exact miracle and uh, and he just healed a ton of people and yet n they're still asking no it ha had not been that long ago and they're still they're still not with it so next time you have a little trouble in your faith and you and you're starting to kind of talk bad about yourself. I can't believe I'm, I w wish I didn't fail like that. Well, just go back and read about the disciples, okay? You're in good company. Alright? We all do it. We all have trouble. So, here's I, I copied this because Michael Green, he wrote this uh, commentary called The Message of Matthew. It's really insightful. It's more of a, a story-like commentary. It's not all academic. Listen to what he wrote. Why were the disciples so perplexed about, about what Jesus would do when faced with this hungry throng in the wilderness? 
They had, after all, seen him feed 5,000 people from a few bread rolls. Their obtuseness accords well enough with what we know of them at this time, but is it not very natural? Is it not like us? We see some marvelous display of the Lord's power, and yet we are full of doubts when we're thrown into another situation of need that casts us back on Him. We simply do not expect Him to act the second time. They were like that, it seems. And it may be that they did indeed remember the feeding of the 5,000, but they also remembered other occasions when they were in real need and those needs remained unmet. And so their faith burned low and expectancy shrank. But is it not so with us? Lack of trust often springs from forgetfulness of past blessings. You want to hang on to some trust and faith in the Lord? Don't forget what He's already done. Has has the Lord done anything for you ever recently? Maybe that's a good exercise for this afternoon. Maybe after, after lunch and we're nice and full and we're sitting around, maybe we ought to take out a piece of paper and a pen and start writing out. And let me think of some things God's done for me. You might be surprised at how long it takes you because you keep remembering and you keep writing. And next thing you know, you've got several pages filled up. And then what you should do with those pages is set them aside and the next time you start to doubt the Lord's goodness or His grace or His mercy or His ability or His power, maybe you ought to go find those sheets and start reading. And maybe you ought to remember the goodness of God. That's what I need to do. Jesus cares about people. Jesus has compassion for people. Verse 37, Jesus provided for the needs of all the people and more. I mentioned before about the baskets of leftovers. You know what's interesting about that? When Jesus fed the 5,000, mostly Jewish audience, 5,000 men plus women and children, Does anyone remember how many baskets of leftovers they picked up? Twelve. Twelve tribes of Israel. Twelve baskets of leftovers. Look in your Bible. Verse 37. When Jesus feeds this mostly Gentile crowd, there's seven baskets of leftovers. Seven is the number of completeness. The ministry of Christ is for the whole world. Now that may or may not be coincidence or or may not be anything at all. But it is kind of interesting the fact that, that we have a specific number of leftovers. And they're different for the two crowds. Now, whether or not that's the case is really ultimately irrelevant. But what's important is this. Jesus demonstrates care. And He demonstrates compassion. He doesn't just have care and compassion. He demonstrates care and compassion. You see the difference? Here's a good example. I learned this from one of my good friends. He's in Alabama now. And um, we served together at the State Baptist Convention. His name's Roosevelt Morris. I don't know if any of you may have ever heard him preach. He's one of my good friends. And one day, ironically enough, when Elizabeth, our oldest daughter, had just been born and was in the NICU for a number of days right after she was born, And Roosevelt comes walking past my office at the Baptist Convention, and he stops to ask me how she's doing. And I try to give him a little update, you know, well, this is looking like it's going to be okay, and this is what's happening. He said, well, I'm going to pray for you. I said, okay, and I kind of turned around, because, you know, what do people do? Well, I've done it. I'm going to be praying for you, and then I walk off. You know what Roosevelt did? He said, I'm going to pray for you. I said, okay, and as I went to turn, he put his hand on my shoulder and he started praying. 
right there. He didn't just tell me he was going to pray. He prayed. He didn't just say he cared. He showed me he cared. He didn't wait around, didn't put it off. He didn't make a promise that he would have to later fulfill. He prayed for me right then. And that's made a lasting impression on me. And I, I try to do that more often. I don't always do it right, but I try to do that more often because of that. So, so what is the personal application for all these principles we've seen? The, the, the care and the compassion, the healing, the providing, all the things that Jesus has done up to this point, and especially here in this text when he's now extending that ministry to Gentiles, not just Jews. Here's our personal application. It's questions for, our, for our, ourselves. Do we care? Should we care? Does Jesus care if we care? I, don't, I can't answer the first one. It's for anybody but myself. But I can answer the other ones. Should we care? Yeah, we should. Jesus cared, we should care. Does Jesus care whether or not we care? Yes, He does very much. Because more so than I care about my child's heart when I'm telling them to do something, and I know it's for their good, but they don't see it. They want to know why, right? Isn't that the question the kid always asks? Go do that. Why? Because I said so. Why? Just go do it. Right? They want to. They want to know. They want to understand it before they agree to it, because they can't just trust that you've got their best interest in mind. More so than I could ever have for my kids, Jesus has our best in mind all the time, and we will rarely understand it. And it's all the more important that we do what He says. And we do so joyfully, thankfully, even uh, immediately. Delayed obedience is a form of disobedience. Let that sit on you for a little bit. It will make you mad eventually. But that's only because you know it's true. Jesus cares just as much about our hearts as He does about our obedience. He wants us to care as much about people as He cares about people. And how did He demonstrate His level of care and compassion? It was always with actions, not just words. Jesus wants our hearts to be engaged in our care and compassion for other people. That's because He did it the exact same way. He showed us the perfect example of what it means to truly have care and compassion for others. He didn't just say it, He did it. And that's what we should do as well. Let's pray.